Hey, listen, I want to start off with something a little bit different today. I want to talk about why today's message is important regardless of whether you have no faith, different faith, or some, uh, some faith. And here's why, because no matter who you are, everyone in every generation has had to deal with this one problem that we're going to talk about today. And here's the one problem that every person in every generation, regardless of whether you have no faith, some faith, or different faith, has had to wrestle with. And I'm going to put it up on the screen, and it goes, sometimes we think and feel like we're right, but we're has that, has that ever happened? Raise your hand if that's ever happened to you, right? Like sometimes I think and I feel like I'm 100% right only to discover that I'm wrong. And this happens to everyone in every generation. This is a problem whether you have no faith, some faith, or different faith. Matter of fact, I experienced this very thing very significant in my 12th grade year as a senior. Now I need to give you a little bit of background. Um, I didn't go to middle school um, and I didn't go to most of my high school. I was in the juvenile justice system and I had been through a bunch of boys' homes. And I finally went to my high school, the high school that I graduated halfway through my junior year. And I was in this senior English class in my senior year. And it was like the breakfast club. I mean, there was the jock who partied too much, the girl who threw all the big parties. It was me, the ex-con was in this group. Like this was the English class to graduate you so you wouldn't come back to school, right? This is the English class that I was in. Um, we had a midterm or a final. I'm forgetting whether it was a midterm or final. It was so long ago now. But I remember that we had like the study period. And we, she, our teacher was really cool. She gave us some time to study. And then she had this day where we all practiced the test. And she said, hey, some of these questions are going to be on there. And we went through it. And then I remember she gave me a compliment in class, which is really rare for any teacher to ever give me a, co a compliment. She was like, man, you've really been studying. I think you're going to do really well. And I was fired up about this test because I had actually studied. I actually tried. I needed to graduate high school. I did not want to go to summer school. Um, and so I studied. And then came the time for our midterm, our final. And I took it and I walked out of that class and I just dabbed you know I was like man I'm fly and anybody that uses the word fly just dates you to the 80s right can I get an amen right and so I walked out of there walking on it because listen I felt like and I thought man I aced it I knew the questions I thought I answered them right and I just man I was like man I crushed it I killed it and then when I got my test back I got a D now it's sad, right? But, you know, it, it helped me understand something as I became an adult, which is sometimes I think and feel like I'm right, but I'm um, And it got me thinking, has that ever happened to you where you, you thought you were right? You, it, was so, it felt so right. It couldn't be wrong, right? You just felt that way. Come on, come on. Now, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but did you ever date anyone that you just thought and felt like it was good and it ended wrong? And if you're married to him, don't say anything right now. <laughs> right? I mean, come on, come on. How many of us have ever bought something? How, come on, raise, how many of you have ever bought something? You said, listen, I have to have this. I'm sure I can afford it. I'm sure I'll use it all the time. There's no way I'll regret this purchase. And then you thought it and you felt right, but you bought it and you never used it and you couldn't afford it. And it felt so good and felt so right and you discovered you were wrong. How about this? Did you ever befriend someone? You became someone's friend and you thought it was right and it felt so right that you guys were going to be best friends forever. But your mom and your daddy told you, right? And your besties told you. They said, listen, don't. And you felt and thought you were right, but you were. I mean, have you ever said anything? I mean, I don't know about you, but I've said a lot of stupid things in my life that I look back. And at the time when I said them, I thought and felt like I was right, but it turned out I was now, why is this? Why is this that sometimes that we think, we just think it's so obvious that I'm right and it feels so right. How can we think and feel so right about something and end up being wrong? Well, here's the reason why I'm going to put it up. Listen, the easiest person in the world to fool is, <laughs> come on, am I the only one that understands that? <laughs> the easiest person in the world to fool is ourselves because, listen, we, when we want something, when we like something, we just will make every excuse and we'll think and feel like something is right only to discover that it's actually wrong because we are the easiest people in the world to fool is ourselves. Which leads us to a truth. Listen, you don't need to come to church. You don't need to read the Bible. Listen, you don't need faith to understand this. You've experienced this if you've been alive for more than seven years. Listen, we're going to put it up on the screen. It's on your inserts, right? And it says, if my thinking and feelings can be flawed, I need something to measure myself against. This is why humanity has mirrors. 
right? Listen, if my thinking and feelings can be flawed, I need something to measure myself against. Listen, this is why we have mirrors. This is why before you walk out of the door or when you're at the mall or whether you're in the car, like, listen, the reason that we have mirrors is because sometimes we think we look good, but your mama lied. And then you go and look in the mirror and you realize you have a hair sticking up or a hanger or something in your tooth, right? And you know, hey, listen, listen, come on, come on, listen. You know it's a good friend when they go, hey, you got a little something in your tooth, man. You need to like, you need to, like, that's a good friend. Because even though you think and it feels like you look good, the reality is, is you don't. So we need something to measure ourselves against. And here's the thing. We don't like this truth, but we know that it's true. And listen, here's the reality. Whether you have no faith whether you have different faith or whether you have some faith, this truth applies. If our thinking and feelings can be flawed, regardless of where you are on the faith spectrum, everyone, everyone needs something to measure themselves against because if you don't, you'll aim for right but hit wrong. And no one wants to aim for right and hit wrong. It's disappointing. It can be damaging. It's dangerous and it hurts. You see, we're in week three of a series called, I want to believe in God, but. And this week we're going to tackle one of the, the tough questions, which is, I want to believe in God, but what about this Bible thing? We're going to put it up on the screen. I want to believe in God, but I'm not sure about this whole Bible thing. And listen, here's the great thing is the reason that we have the Bible is because, listen, God knew that humanity would need a mirror to look at. Matter of fact, that's what the Bible says is. The Bible says, listen, I'm a mirror so that as you measure your life and you measure yourself against something, when your feelings or thinking is flawed, you have a mirror that can help you direct what it's going. Matter of fact, we see this in 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says this, we're going to put up there, it says, all scripture is inspired by God. And we'll get to that. And I understand, listen, if you have no faith or different faith, I can understand that you might not believe that, but that's what the Bible says it's about, it says it's inspired by God and it is useful to teach us what is true. So sometimes we think something is true or we feel like something's true, but it's, how many of us have ever thought this was true love and it wasn't, right? I mean, how many of us thought we had to have that thing and we discovered we didn't? How many of us thought the thing that we said was the right thing to say, but understanding later that it was the wrong thing? See, it helps teach us what is true and it makes us realize what is wrong. It kind of sets a standard so that our thinking and our feelings don't determine that there's a standard in our lives. And it goes on to say, it corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us what to do what's right. It doesn't just tell us what is wrong. It teaches us how to live what is right. It understands, God understands that you and I want to aim for life. I mean, Jesus said this. He said, I came that you might have life and life to the full. The reason God gave humanity a Bible is because we need something outside of ourselves to measure ourselves against because our thinking and our feelings can be flawed. Now, if you're here or you're watching this on YouTube or on our website and you came here because someone said, hey, you should come here this series. Listen, this is a fair and valid question, which is why should I trust or believe the Bible? Now, for all of you churchgoers, I need to tell you something. That's a fair question. Never, ever be mad at someone for asking that question because it's a question that you should be able to answer. If you answer that because the Bible says so, that's a really bad answer. That's called circular logic that just, you know, you're not helping anyone. You should be able to give the reason for the faith that you have. That's what the scripture says. And so listen, anyone asking, hey, Matt, hey, um, I'm here. Why should I trust? Why should I believe in the Bible? We should be able to give an answer. And here's the amazing, amazing thing, is that there is significant and reasonable evidence for you and I to trust the Bible implicably. Now here's what I wanna say. I wanna say, to, say something, because I know that there are some people in this audience, maybe, maybe you, you really don't have faith yet, or maybe you have a little bit of a different faith, or, or maybe you walked away from faith and, and you're going, Matt, I, you know, I believe in God and maybe Jesus, but really this whole Bible thing. And, and here's what I wanna say to everyone in that crowd. And, and it goes to me like, listen, you and I are gonna pick some kind of standard to measure our life against. It might not be the Bible, but all of us will pick something. And the real question is, not what are you going to pick, is, but what is you going to pick? Is it really a good mirror that will actually help you pick the life that you want and you were meant for? Now, here's the great news as we go through some things. Did you know I've read the Bible front to back for, for almost 20 years now? And listen, never once in the Bible have I said or read in the Bible that you need to check your brains at the door when discussing the Bible. The Bible's never asked you to give up intellectual honesty. 
The Bible's never asked you or I for blind faith. And so I hope over the next few minutes, the next maybe 20 minutes or so, we're going to go over why I believe you can put your trust in the Bible. But let me say something. Let me say, this is just the start of the journey, not the end, because you can literally get a PhD in this thing. And so if you're expecting me to cover everything that you can get a PhD in 20 minutes, I'm not that good. So I'm hoping this is start your journey if you have legitimate questions, but it should not be the end of your journey. And so here's what I want to do. I want to talk about kind of the five or four, the four biggest objections that I typically get when it comes to the Bible. And I think by going through these four objections, we'll see that there's evidence and logic in kind of believing and understanding and following and trusting the Bible. And so here's kind of the first objection that we will usually run into. Isn't the Bible a bunch of myths and fairy tales? How many of you have ever been, ever heard someone say that, right? <clears throat> My 12th grade English teacher said this. My 12th grade English says, isn't the Bible just a bunch of myths and fairy tales? Now, whenever someone asks me that question, I always ask a question right back. I always smile and go, that's really interesting. Please tell me what research or books you've read to discover that the Bible's a book of myths and fairy tales. And that usually stops people cold in the tracks because they've never, ever read anything. And then I go, have you ever read the Bible? And then usually most people go, oh, and I go, so, so how, how did you come to this thing? How did you come to the conclusion that the, the Bible is just a bunch of myths and fairy tales? I, I want to understand, like, have you done any research? Because a lot of people have investigated this. Because the Bible's unique. And so we're going to look at three things, three things that give evidence. We're going to look at what is called literary evidence. I'm going to put the three things up there. There's three evidences. It's literary, um, it's um, manuscript evidence, and it's archaeological. It's coming at some point. Jordan, I have a bunch of slides, and if I miss one, thanks, Jordan. Literary evidence, manuscript evidence, and archaeological evidence. Those are kind of the evidence about the Bible. So we're going to take a little bit of time on the first objection so that you can understand that the Bible is worthy of your trust, my trust, and our trust to be a standard in our life. Now here's the interesting about, thing about the Bible. Did you know the Bible never starts off saying, in a galaxy far, far away? <laughs> Did you know the Bible never starts off once upon a time in a distant land? Did you know none of the accounts in the Bible start off like that? Matter of fact, it starts off dramatically different. Matter of fact, in Luke 1, 1 through 4, I'm going to put it up on the screen, and I think this is why uh, the screen didn't come up. We're going to read, um, no, we're going to go back up to, do we have Luke 1, 1 through 4? Sorry, sometimes I'm a little bit out of sight. There you go, Luke 1, 1 through 4 says, and this is Luke, okay? Luke gives us one of the four Gospels, right? And Luke tells you how he's, he came to think. He says, many have undertaken to draw up account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking about Jesus, the life, the death, and the resurrection. And by the way, you and I can disagree on this, but the tomb historically is empty, okay? The, the tomb is empty. That's the most important thing because if Jesus was still in the tomb, that means all of his good words were good words but they had no power to bring life. And because the tomb is empty, we have power to live life. And that's why he says, we got to talk about this. Okay, that's just old school preaching, but we're going to keep it going here, right? Many have undertaken to drop the account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, right? And he says, just as they were handed down to us, those who were from first were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord. He says, listen, I'm not passing along hearsay. I've, in, I've investigated and these were handed down from first eyewitnesses and servants of the words. And then he goes on to say, with this in mind, since I myself have what carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So Luke says, listen, I wanted to write up what happened, but I didn't just want to make up a story. I didn't want to get it wrong. Matter of fact, this is so important. So he goes, I went to the eyewitnesses who were there, and then I carefully investigated everything from the beginning. Now, doesn't that sound a lot different than in a galaxy far, far away or some time ago in a distance a long time ago? Like this, this doesn't start off like a fairy tale. It doesn't start off like a myth. It doesn't start off like a legend. It's an eyewitness account, especially the New Testament. It's an eyewitness account that has been thoroughly and carefully investigated. 
And the first piece of evidence we're going to look at is what they call literary evidence. And literary evidence is it's really boring. If you, I've taken a class on this, and I promise you, no one ever should sit one through one of these. And it's really boring. Um, it talks about how when you look at a book, how you can tell if it has internal um, cohesion, and and you look at it, and you look at the language, and you look at all these things, and go, does it match what it says? And is there internal unity within the book itself? Because that speaks to whether you should believe it or not. And so I want to talk a little bit about the literary evidence for the Bible. And this is where people, when you talk about about the Bible, I go, listen, when you say the Bible is a book of myths and legends, you don't understand, first of all, the Bible isn't one book. The Bible is 66 different books. And 40 plus authors from varied backgrounds. Some were kings, some were scribes, some were warriors. I mean, they, some were shepherds. Like it's 66 different books, including the Old Testament and the New Testament. 40 plus authors. It was written on three different continents. It was written in three different languages. It had a, over a 1500 year time span. And when scholars look at it, if they're honest, it has a coherent message and thematic unity over that span. And it makes it unique in literature. It doesn't mean it's divine. I've had people and I've talked about this. They go, well, that doesn't mean it's divine. I go, no, it doesn't mean it's divine, but it does mean it's unique. And it does say something that there's a coherent message and there's thematic unity from the beginning of something to the end of something that was 66 different books by 40 different authors written on three different continents in three different languages over 1,500 years. And it tells the same story. That's pretty impressive. I mean, it's pretty amazing. This, this isn't like one person. Like there, there are other religious writings that were written by one person in a cave somewhere and they wrote it and they pass it down and they say, this is what I got. This is uniquely different than that. And here's where it gets even better. The literary, literary evidence within the Bible is very cohesive, but then the manuscript evidence, and, and this is again, very boring. Typically only academics care about this stuff. And, and when we talk about pieces of antiquities, what they really wanna know is, please tell us the number of manuscripts and then the closest they are. Think of like the Civil War. Would you want a recording or someone who wrote something about the Civil War 10 years after the Civil War or someone who wrote after the Civil War 200 years? You would trust the person who wrote after 10 years Years, not the person who wrote after 100 years because the person closest to us probably had the better memory. Now, some of the gold standards in literary are the Gaelic Wars. This is about Julius Caesar's. And right now there's about 10 copies. And the closest copy we have to this era for Julius Caesar and kind of his Roman Empire is a thousand years from the original copy. And again, I'm talking about the gold standard in literature for ancient pieces of antiquity, the same time of Jesus. These are the gold standards. And then you have um, Pliny the Younger wrote Natural History, and he talked about this era, and it's also a gold standard. There's only seven copy, and the closest copy is 750 years. Homer's the Iliad, which many of you had to read in high school or in college, right? Listen, again, gold standard is about 500 copies, with the closest being 500. Now, in the same time period of the New Testament, these Three are the gold standards. So what would make you feel good, not as a follower or someone with faith, but as someone who would look at reasonable evidence? What is the evidence that we have in society, in archaeology? What is, this, what is the kind of things that we have? Bruce Metzger was the professor at Princeton University, and even his critics would say he was one of the foremost scholars in New Testament text. And Bruce Metzger said there's roughly 24,000 copies of the New Testament with the closest fragment being within about 50 years of the life of Jesus. So I want you to take a look at kind of the manuscript evidence compared to the other gold standards of how we measure pieces of antiquity. And I want to ask an honest question. Does the Bible meet the standard? Yes. Yes. Matter of fact, the Bible exceeds any standard that we use for any other piece of antiquity. And it gets even more mind-boggling. Listen, I could bore you for hours with this stuff. I could, I promise you, and I don't want to bore you. But here's what I do want to do. I want to ask anyone with no faith or different faith to understand that people that believe in the Bible don't believe in fairy tales and myths. They believe in reasonable evidence. And the evidence is the literary evidence, the manuscript evidence, which matches and exceeds anything that we else. Listen, if you're going to believe anything about ancient history, but don't believe the Bible, then you're not believing the thing that has the best evidence of any piece of antiquity. Hands down. Which leads us to the archaeological evidence. I mean, this is where it's amazing. And again, this is where I geek out. Listen, I just need to be really honest. This is where I nerd out, man. Like, I love archaeology. I could tell you a bunch of stories. I've done research, man. I just get all nerdy. I just think it's all cool. And I just, because listen, I don't want to put my life in something that can't hold the weight of it. 
Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever call for blind faith. Jesus says, look at the evidence of my miracles and at least believe on that. So in archeological, Luke, Luke, the guy that we said, he carefully investigated, said, do you know Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities and nine islands and he gets none of them wrong. Luke is a first rate historian. Now, in the early, in the early kind of enlightenment period, the Bible got a bad rap because especially Luke, and they said, Luke, Luke, you know, he got a lot of things right, but Luke also got some, some things wrong. He uses this term, Lysenius the Tetrarch of Abilene, and he, and he gets the date wrong. He actually wasn't that person during that time. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, they thought Luke had got it wrong until modern archaeology dug up, dug up this beam, right? And they found this beam, and they found this inscription. They actually found two inscriptions dated right from the time that he said, that said, Freeman of Lysenius the Tetrarch. And they went, oh, Luke was right for hundreds of years. We thought he was wrong, but when we actually found the archaeological evidence, it proves what he said was true. Matter of fact, Luke also had this other thing. He used this term, um, and we're going to go to the next slide, um, um, the polyatrix, the city officials, and there was no reference. Listen, in Greek literature, in any piece of Greek literature, because it's somewhat limited, there was no reference to this term. But Luke used it in his copies and in his Gospels, and they said, Luke's got to be wrong because we've never, ever seen this word used anywhere in Greek writing. Oh, until until they did this archeological dig and they found these two paver stones in the first century archre in the time of the polyarch. Like they discovered and they said, oh, we were wrong, Luke was. And I could just bore you with a whole bunch more really cool archeological study stuff. But instead of me boring you, I wanna summate with one of the greatest archeological, like kind of the Indiana Jones in real life. His name is Dr. Nelson Glick. Matter of fact, we're gonna put his quote up in here. Uh, Nelson uh, Glick, Dr. Nelson Glick said, it may be stated categorically. So what he's saying is, listen, you encompass everything. It can be stated categorically that no archeological discovery has ever controverted a single biblical reference. Not one. Now, you might be asking, well, who is this Dr. Nelson Gluck? Okay, by the way, just so you know, he was the president of a university. He was an academic. He discovered 1,500 sites. He was so famous that he gave the benediction at JFK's inauguration. During World War II, he had so much knowledge of the Holy Land of Palestine that the U.S. government asked him to come in and said, if Rommel retreats out of Africa through Palestine, which way will he pick? He was on the cover of Time magazine. This isn't some backwards preacher who has no education. This is one of the most educated people who's a president. And he says, listen, there's no piece of archaeology out there. All we have is things that support the Bible. So listen, there's the literary evidence within the Bible that says that it's thematic, it's unity, right? You have the manuscript evidence that says, listen, we have the closest piece. We have so many of them. It's, it's kind of reliable. You should look at it. And then we have archaeology that supports the things that the Bible says, the places, the times. And I could go on to you and, bo again, bore you forever, of all the extra biblical resources that say the things that are in the Bible are there. And we're going to come to one of them a little bit later. But here's the thing that I want you to take away from. The Bible is not a book of myths or fairy tales. It's a narrative of history, of unique writers who wrote down what God did in history and time. And it is supported by manuscript evidence and archeological evidence. Now you can disagree whether the writings are divine or not, but as far as looking at it as history, it's pretty, pretty solid if you're gonna believe anything about history. And so that kind of takes care of objection number one. Isn't it just a book of fairy tales and myths, Matt? But then here's the second one. Now, before we get to the second one, don't put it on the screen because I need everyone, everyone lean on, okay, because this isn't going to be boring. This, this is going to be the one that everyone gets. This is the emotional one. Remember we said when we started this series that when you are emotionally overwhelmed, it, it kind of hinders us from thinking clearly and that we really need to admit that when we're overwhelmed with emotion, uh, that it can twist how we see God. And this is the biggest objection right after, isn't the Bible just a book of myths and fairy tales? And it's this, it's this objection right here. So much, so much harm has been done because of it, the Bible. Yeah, Matt, you know, I, you know maybe that's true. There's all that evidence for the Bible. And, and maybe you can look at archaeology and manuscript and you can look at the internal and go, man, there's, you, you should trust it. But man, 
I mean, look, look, at, look at the Crusades, look at, look at slavery, look at misogyny, which is kind of the abuse of women and the, and the degradation of females, and, and go, man, look, look at all the things that were done um, horribly in the name of the Bible, and so I just, I won't put my trust in something like that. And what I have to do in that moment is go, man, that's, that's a pretty emotionally laden statement, isn't it? And people go, yeah, and I go, man, yeah. I mean, no one wants to see bigotry. Racism is always wrong, and misogyny is wrong. And I don't think there's a person that when you actually talk about the person of Jesus, you go, I mean, the life of Jesus, Jesus cared for women. He gave them dignity and value. Jesus cared for the poor and the oppressed. He stuck up for, the, for injustice. I mean, Jesus would never support racism or bigotry and misogyny. And matter of fact, Jesus is the one who says, listen, you search the scriptures, yet they point to me. So if you look at the scriptures and they don't look like Jesus, then maybe it's you who's reading the scriptures wrong, not that the scriptures are wrong. And here's what I discovered. Just because you misuse something doesn't make it wrong. So I'm just going to take a quick little survey. And you may have, you may have heard me use this example before. Um, but how many of you have ever got a bad haircut? Anybody ever got a, I've gotten a bad haircut before, right? Anybody ever got a bad haircut? Did that stop you from, get, did that stop you from getting a, a haircut again? No. You didn't go, oh my gosh, I got a bad haircut. I'm never getting my haircut again. Oh no. No, you just went to a different barber or hairdresser or salon, like whatever the appropriate term is. If I got that wrong, hairdresser, salon, barber, whatever people, like, sorry, I want to get it right, right? Like, no, you said they did a bad job, but it doesn't mean haircuts are bad. Listen, I, here's what I don't understand. We get this all the time. Listen, and I'm, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, push down on people, but can, can we be honest? We see people misuse food all the time, don't we? We see people who misuse food and they hurt their bodies and they hurt themselves because they misuse food. But none of us are not eating. I know this. I saw y'all pounding those donuts out in the hallway. <laughs> right? Listen, just because some people misuse food doesn't mean we stop eating food. We see people misuse money. People always misquote the Bible and say, the money is the root of all evil. And I go, you're just getting it wrong. Again, you're misusing it. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is neutral. You know, you can do some good things with money. You can pay for some surgeries. You can help some people. I mean, you can do a lot of good things with money. Money is neutral, but you, you know what? A lot of people can do bad things with money. I mean, think about it. Sex. God created it to be good. I know it's church. You're like, whoa, he just said sex in church. Yeah, God created it. Just, just so you know, it was his idea. He, he's not freaked out by it. I, I personally, as a married man, I'm Now, now, can we bring, like, listen, people misuse it. But we don't say it's bad because it's misused. And I want to encourage you and go, just because so much harm has been done because it doesn't mean what's in the Bible is wrong. It just means people misused it for their own ends. And can we just admit that? And here's the hard part, and here's the part I don't get. And I want to speak specifically to Christians right now, people that say they follow Jesus. You know, sometimes the best thing we can do is apologize. We can just say we got it wrong. At some point, we need to look at our history and look to the Indian people and say, we committed genocide. We're sorry. Jesus would not want to do that for any political reason. It's like, we should just apologize for that. Christians should look back at the slavery in our nation and how we unjustly treated people of a different color and go, we're sorry. The church should have stood up. When it comes to the abuse of women and the abuse of children, the church should be the first place that stands up and say, I'm sorry, we didn't do more. And you know what's amazing? If Christians and people that said they followed Jesus would apologize for the times it was misused and didn't support it, I think people's opinions would be changed. So listen, just because somebody misuses something doesn't mean it's wrong. And then here's kind of the third objection I get. And I've actually seen cults use this before. And it goes something like this. It goes, listen, um, there's so many different versions that can't be trusted. I literally had someone from a cult say, there's so many different versions of the Bible, and so it can't be trusted, so you should trust me. And I laughed. I laughed. And I said, and I said I'm, I'm confused by this because, listen, I, I've read different versions, and, and the thing I'm confused about what you're saying is, don't you know that different versions don't mean different things? I mean, is it possible that different versions just mean it's not a different message? It's just the same message said differently? Let me say that one more time. A different version doesn't mean a different message. It just means 
the same message said differently. Let me, I'm gonna give you a quick example. We're gonna run through this. I don't want this to be boring, but we're gonna kind of speed read this. And so I'm gonna give you some different versions of the famous verse, John 3, 16, okay? And we're gonna kind of look at these different versions, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten. I don't know why, who uses begotten. I don't use begotten, but it's a version. The begotten son, that whosoever, I don't use that word anymore, whosoever believeth, it's old King James, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. King James, right? Okay, next version, right? For God so greatly loved the dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes in him and trusts in him as savior shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the amplified version. Our next version is the SV. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's the ESV. Next version. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. New Living Translation. Next one. This is the message. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed, but by believing in him, anyone can have whole and lasting life. Did you notice that we read five different versions? Did they say something different? They all said the, they all said the same thing. Listen, different versions don't mean different messages. Y'all miss that. Different versions don't mean different messages. Different versions means it's the same message said differently. And here's why. Because some things are so important that we need to break the language barrier and the understanding barrier. And however we need to say a principle or point needs to get commuted, it is so important that we say it in a way that people can understand. If I spoke Latin up here, I could be telling you all the truth in the world, but you would not be able to... So the language that I use really matters. So listen, there's different versions, not because they're different messages. There's different versions because it's the same message is so important that regardless of your culture, your background, your language, the principles and the truths of the Bible, the standards so that you can aim for what is right so you don't end up with wrong is so important. It said a bunch of different ways, so that, but it all says the same thing. So you, can you see? How even though there's different versions, it's the same message. Which leads me into number four, which is this. Doesn't the Bible contradict itself? And I love this question. I love when people, because sometimes people think they're really smart. They're like, doesn't the Bible contradict itself? Oh, you're so smart. And I always ask them this question. I go, yeah, which one? And then people stop because I go, which contradiction are you talking about? Because I've read the Bible. I've read it a lot, front to back, multiple years. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying, I love Jesus. I want to learn. It's the standard. Like, which Tell, tell me where, like, when you say that statement, which contradiction are you talking about? And that usually ends the conversation. And then I go, like, no, listen, listen, let's just talk a little bit about it, because that's a fair question. You've probably heard that, but the first question I ask is, have you actually read the Bible? That, listen, here's what I discovered. When people actually read the Bible for themselves, you will be amazed. All the stuff I just talked about, you'll be like, where's all these things that people are saying? Because I don't see it. I remember reading the Bible in jail, locked up as a hardened criminal and going, man, this Jesus dude rocks. Dude, you see how he stands up to the people? I mean, before Pilate, they were gonna crucify him and he just stood up there and he said nothing. I mean, he led the way onto Jerusalem knowing they were gonna take his life and he conquered hell and death and he stuck up for, Jesus, like, why didn't anybody tell him? Like, I went to church, why didn't anybody talk about this dude? He rocks. But I always ask people, have you actually read the thing that you think has contradictions? And so I just want to briefly cover this so that we can kind of end and land here. And, and then does it contradict? And first we have to understand what contradiction means. Contradiction means that it holds two opposite truths to be true at the same time. And I've read the Bible and nowhere does it do that. Now there are differences in the Bible. And most of the time when you discover the differences, there's a logical and reason, reason for it. First is language translations. Like in Acts, Paul has this uh, appearance where Jesus appears to him, right? And it says he heard this voice, but the people didn't hear. And, and so people have said, oh, you heard a voice and they heard something, but then they didn't hear what was spoken. Ah, see, that's a contradiction. And no, it's just a Greek language issue where it is the same word is used for two, two different things. One, to actually hear something. And then the way it's spaced to say, you heard, but you didn't hear. Like we got any spouses in the room? Have you ever yelled down something to your spouse and they go, what? And that's what they're saying. And so sometimes it's a language difference in there. Sometimes it's just because when you have eyewitness testimony, like in the Gospels, you have different accounts. One of the Gospels in Mark says the thieves on the cross were hurling insults. 
When you look at Luke, Luke says one of the thieves was hurling the insults. The other thief received grace. And so his testimony kind of deepens and kind of expresses what's going on. It's not contradicting. It's the same thing, just told from two different vantage points. If you ever talk to a police officer, any investigator, eyewitness accounts will always vary, but they'll inevitably tell the same story if they're telling the truth, which lastly leads to the unknown. There are just some things we don't know. Matter of fact, this happened a couple hundred years ago, well, since the beginning, since the Bible was written, in the book of Daniel. Daniel names this king, and, he, and he's called Belshazzar. Um, it's a Babylonian name, uh, and he said, Belshazzar was the king of Babylon when it fell to the Medes and the Persians. And historians laughed. You can't trust the Bible. It can't be God's word, because Belshazzar was not the king at that time. It was, it was Nabonidus. Nabonidus was the king. And everyone knows this. All the other kingdoms had done research and had historians, had had Nabonidus as the king of Babylon. And so for centuries, people made fun of the Bible and said, Daniel's wrong. You can't believe Daniel. Until in 1885, almost the early 1900s, out in the, in the, in the Mideast, they discovered in these Babylonian archaeological records this, this, this tablet that Nabonidus had, like, had scribes. And he had a son named Belshazzar, who, when he left the kingdom for a decade and went and lived somewhere almost 500 miles away, he left his son in charge to run the kingdom of Babylon. And so all of a sudden, what people thought was wrong turned out to be right, but we just didn't have all the information. And so, no, I've read the Bible front to back. There may be a few differences, but I think they're all very explainable. And so hopefully after the last little 25 minutes here, 30 minutes, I've tried to give you as much information to go, listen, listen, there is significant and logical reason to put your hope and your trust in the Bible. Now here's the question. All of us are going to measure our lives against something. What are you going to measure your life against so that when you aim for right, you actually hit it? And if it's not the Bible, what is it? Do you have enough reasonable evidence that it can hold the weight of your life. As I close, I wanna land with this. I was reading a book this week. I read a bunch of books outside of the Christian faith and, and this book was called The Four Agreements. I'm gonna put up a quote. Um, it's by Dion, uh, uh, Don Miguel. Um, if we can put up that quote, it's the last quote. It's coming. Thanks, Jordan. It's The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. Um, and here's what he says in his book, because this, this really caught my attention. He says, we are hard on ourselves for not being what we wish to be. Can we go up one more? I think he does he say something else? Yeah. He says, we're all human and have failings. Remember how I started off? That like, listen, each of us, right? We can think we're right. We can feel like we're right, but we end up being because we're humans and we all have feelings. We see it as a major challenge to meet perfection and consequently we are not good enough for ourselves. We, we all have this idea of what we want to be but we know we don't meet it. And he goes on to say this. We are hard on ourselves for not being what we wish to be, rather what we believe we should be. So he says, listen, we fail. We can't reach the standard that we want to have and we can't even be who we wish to be. But then here's what stunned me. He suggests that the most important person we must believe is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. you just said we're flawed. You, you just said we can't become what we wish to be. We're, we're, we're failed, like we, we can't meet the standard. How am I of a flawed person supposed to believe in myself? Do you, do you see the contradiction in that statement? To become all that you're supposed to be, believe in yourself. And the question is, what he's saying is, you become your own standard. And here's my question back to that. If you are flawed, how will you ever get to where you're supposed to be if you are your own standard? It just doesn't work. And that's why the Bible matters. It's why it should be the final authority in our life. Matter of fact, we're going to put up a screen. It's the U version. I really want to encourage, if you're at our Lesby campus, if you're at our second service, you're watching on YouTube, I want to give you a challenge for 30 days. Download the U version Bible app. And you, it's free. And they send you a verse a day. And did you know they have these little reading plans for free? And you can go through them and just do these little reading plans. And I'm telling you, it's amazing. And here's what I encourage you for the next 30 days, pick up a reading plan or two and kind of go through it, read the verse of the day and allow that to be kind of your mirror against your life and see if it looks like a fairy tale or myth. See if it looks like it asks you to harm people. Look and see if it looks like it's a contradiction. Look and see if the different versions mean a different message. And I think when you do this after 30 days, you'll realize that while it's hard and you may not understand everything, 
The Bible is a great mirror so that we can aim for what is right and not end up with what is wrong. Let me pray and close. Hey, God, thank you that you gave us the Bible, a mirror, so that we can see um, that when we are missing it, God, and we're aiming for right, but we end up with wrong, you give us the Bible so we don't have to end up there. Thank you for the gift of Jesus that gives us grace that when we miss it, God, help us to um, include your word in our lives so we don't end up where we don't want to be. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.